I will not speak about that. I do a lot of things. I do write about a lot of things, but uh, Mughal architecture is not one of them. So <laughs> this is the time if you want to <laughs> go back to the house. Uh, so, which means that I'm not an expert in Mughal architecture. Uh, all the uh, topics that Deborah mentioned, um, I think modern, modernity, modernism is something fundamental to my interest. Uh, I also like to say that I grew up in Bangladesh. Um, and in Bangladesh, which was uh, one time a province of the Mughal Empire, uh, we have a double take on anything Mughal. Uh, you know, uh, as being part of a colonial empire, you know, for a long time we'd say the Mughal Empire and all that, we'd shy away from anything to do with Mughal. And any trouble, we either gave it to the British or the Mughals. But then, uh, you know, uh, there are traces uh, the, the, of the imperial culture. Uh, I remember in high school, I used to go out during break and have this, uh, it's called, it's a paratha. I'm sure you're, some of you are familiar with what a paratha is. It's sold by a street vendor, but it's kind of a thick paratha, double layered with omelet and minced meat. Uh, it was a meal, and that was called Mughlai paratha. So it was like a trace from the Mughal time. So I'm saying that, you know, uh, maybe publicly we'd shy away from anything Mughal, but secretly we'd consume the leftovers of the empire. <laughs> so I'm saying that I'm kind of doubly, you know, implicated here. Okay, so uh, I don't know what I'm going to do really, or I don't know how to describe what I'm going to do. I'm not going to describe Mughal architecture in a kind of architectural way, uh, or its technical st stuff, or describe or make an extensive description of Mughal architecture, which I've done actually. I was just telling Deborah about eight, nine years ago at the Academy. So uh, if anybody had been there, I, I, I want to say I'm not going to repeat that today. Um, I think I'll try to tell stories of sorts, kind of storytelling. And it starts like this. Uh, once upon a time, there was a king, an emperor really, here, who ru ruled over multitudes, a babel of beliefs and practices, in a land that stretched from Missouri to Maine and Montreal to Miami, if you wanted to give it an American measure. Who united this babel by sword or sorcery, and if nothing worked, by marriage. Uh, he married, like, you know, and we'll see his palace, you know, where uh, he maintained his marital properties. A king emperor who was known by a tautological title, Akbar the Great. Well, Akbar in Persian means great. So um, how, do you, how do you tackle someone like this? And who but Salman Ruj, this literary fury, could capture this Superman, the great, great one, great in his greatness. And this is Salman Rushdie writing. So great that the reputation in his title was not only appropriate, but necessary. The Grand Mughal, victorious, pensive, overweight, disenchanted, poetic, oversexed, too magnificent uh, to be a single person. And he was. And that Superman of an emperor was also illiterate. And that's the story. It's kind of contested, but, uh, and that's kind of very strange that he should be declared or considered illiterate. Because in the imperial household, women and young children learn many languages. So whether there was a problem with him that he was dyslexic, or, uh, or actually, he really entertained not reading, but looking at manuscripts, you know, the illustrated manuscripts, and that's when it flourished during his time. So it's an interesting story. But nonetheless, it led a revolution in intellectual discourse and curiosity, a kind of what today we might call liberal tolerance, interrupted often by occasional intolerance. And I like to describe that as, you know, maybe in a technical term, proto-modernity, you know, uh, I'm trying to get there. So it was a kind of modernity, and, I, and that may be my sort of central theme here. Because, you know, we want to be very clear about the context. We're talking about 16th, 17th century India, where notions of human dignity, civil liberty, and mutual respect in a world of differences were cut in a very different cloth. Not that it didn't exist. 
because such notions and ideas we immediately ascribe to the Enlightenment in Europe, and we lay the sources of such practices to Europe and the European Enlightenment. But this is like the 16th century, and the Enlightenment would not be around for another 100 years. So it's not that the Mughals picked it up from the Europeans, although there was a big you know, European uh, traffic in the Mughal court, especially in Akbar's court. And let's also not forget the highly nuanced uh, variances of the Babel in India at that time. That today, in today's uh, political uh, context, we tend to overlook, overwrite, and also uh, forget. Uh, and we have become totally partisan, you know, categorical in our description of such things. I, 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 what I'm emphasizing is that is highly nuanced. It would be too simple just to declare it as either Muslim or Islamic. That will only uh, keep us driving us into an ideological dead end as things have become these days. So I think uh, in the Mughal universe, no doubt it was a theater of bloodshed. You'll find reading about uh, the history of that time, Muslim, and I use the word Muslim, I don't know if one declared oneself as a Muslim right away or declared as a Timurid or a Azerbaijani or a Turkmenistani. Uh, that's something to think of. But today, post, uh, in a retro retrospective way, let's say Muslim princes fought Muslim princes. Muslim princes fought Hindu princes. Muslim princes fought Hindu princes supported by Muslim princes. Muslim princes fought Muslim princes supported by Hindu princes. Muslim princes supported by Hindu princes fought Hindu princes supported by Muslim princes. And I could go on. You know, the idea is that it's not like Muslims fighting Hindus, you know, which is kind of a, a narrative that has landed upon us. Sure, often in, there were alliances and alignments where faith and religion of either party were invoked, but also racial, ethnic, and personal loyalty or gains. So it is in that context I would like to approach Mughal architecture. As I was saying, that I just can't describe Mughal architecture. To me, it's, for me now, today, uh, 2014, uh, it's more critical how to approach Mughal architecture. You know, a lot of things have been written about Mughal architecture, uh, still being written about. I think even then, the question is, perhaps even today we are here, like how do we approach Mughal architecture? I'm not talking about Mughal civilization or culture, particularly architecture. Why look at Mughal architecture? And, I, and, I, and that's, that was the uh, sort of self-generated question that popped to me when I got the invitation to come and talk about Mughal architecture. You know, like I could have said, you know, I don't want to do this. But then I thought, you know, uh, why should we do this now? Uh, talk about Mughal architecture now especially in the light of what's going on as a cantankerous conversation on Islam. And it has become impossible to make a simple aesthetical pass at Mughal architecture. You know, that's as good, spectacular, sweet, and all that. Uh, we can't seem to do that anymore. There simply has been a loss of innocence. The exotic orient has become the excitable one, and the disturbance has reached the Occident. So perhaps it's safer to talk about the house. <laughs> uh, and I, I would like to just point out a few things, just in response to why should we look at Mughal architecture and therefore the house, because the genesis of the Doris Duke house is in Mughal architecture, with the commissioning of the bedroom suite, as you all know. So it's entirely justified to do that, talk about Mughal Mughals and their architecture. Um, I had been involved in looking at the house, if I can say that, Deborah, um, and uh, we have had many uh, conversations about this. And I recognize, recognize two critical aspects of the Doric Duke house. One is its origin, and the other is its evolution. There are two things. Uh, the, one is the Mughal suite with its lustrous white marble inspired by this, the rich inlays, the diaphanous screen, which is the original scheme of the house. And it is the singular quality that you see here uh, that has mostly defined Mughal architecture. Or it seems, because I'm going to throw a different uh, image later. The other aspect is the sort of the ensembling of architecture. 
making a hybrid assembly of our juxtaposition of different things, of a kind of fabricated unity or contrived unity which didn't exist before, and perhaps for this house doesn't exist anywhere else. To say that this is an example of Islamic architecture, that has to be qualified because nothing like this exists anywhere else. Unless, that's what I thought recently, Fatipur Sikri by Akbar. Um, so it's a, it's a contrived unity. Uh, Doris Duke may have started with the first one, the particularity of Mughal architecture or singularity, but then she kind of deviated increasingly with the second property, ensembling. So, uh, so we might have to think about Mughal architecture in those two terms, singular sense and, as, and an assemblage. Pluribus and unum, that's what I was thinking about also. That's what Mughal architecture is about. Uh, so if I were to demonstrate what I call the proto-modernity of the Mughals, it will be through architecture, through this particular city, Fatipur Sikri, which was uh, it's a palace complex city built by that illiterate genius Akbar in 1569. 1569, and Akbar abandoned the capital in 1585 and shifted to Agra. And that's been a you know, continuous thing about Agra. You know. So he shifted capital between Delhi, Agra, Lahore, and Fatipur Sikri. Um, strategic, yes. Uh, but now, uh, after the abandonment, there is only silence in the palace. And the fascination for such ruins which we only architects have as a kind of necrophilia. Now people are out, you know, let's look at the architecture. You know, that's how we take photographs also, you know, without people. We wait until the crowd is gone and then we take photographs. But Fatipur Sikri still resonates with what I call a powerful sign of absence. It's still an emblem of what I describe as a naive, tentative, experimental foundation of India's modernity. And I, I emphasize that. It's an experimental foundation of India's modernity and the condition of India's nation state today. And I'll get to that in a second. So Mughal architecture, a little bit about that. Mughal architecture was the last great Indian show from the 16th to the 18th century that was uh, supported, patronized by the Mughal dynasty. It brought a new energy and ethos in Indian art, architecture, and music that remains as a cultural strata you know, for a vast part of South Asia. So the Mughals ruled India, or the Indian subcontinent, or the big part of it from 1526, when Babur came from Central Asia and established that dynasty, to 1858, when political power was usurped by the English. So who were the Mughals? In a long line of trespassers from Central Asia, I said trespassers because they came without invitation. Although the first uh, Mughal king was not quite an emperor, he was invited by people in Delhi to invade Delhi. Back to that, you know, Muslim prince, Hindu prince, and all that. Uh, so there are a lot of trespassers, in, including uh, people we called in the Indo-Europeans or the Aryans who brought Vedic culture to India or uh, cemented that in India. They also arrived from Central Asia. So uh, the Mughals, or related to the Mongols, came from Central Asian nomadic tribe related to both Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, who roamed around, at that time, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, as it is called now, and finally settled in North India after Babur, the first king, defeated the incumbent Delhi Sultan, another Muslim, if you must know, Ibrahim Lodi. With their seat of power in North India, I don't know if you can read the Agra, Delhi, Lahore, those were the kind of centers. Uh, as those centers, the Mughal ran an imperial juggernaut that stretched over a huge geography, and you can see the expansion of the empire and the reduction. So as with many imperial enterprise, the Mughals also displayed despotic and ruthless behavior no different than the Romans or the Brits. Brothers kill brothers, fathers impale sons, sons exile fathers, you know, we know that. But the Mughals formed the most distinctive dynastic rule in India. I would like to argue they literally constructed India. They formed the unum in India's pluribus. 
and with all its conflicts and uh, fissions, provided the foundation of a national narrative. National narrative, which is a very sort of modern cultural political term, but we can back through it and say that was a national narrative. And this is what gave India its modern indicity, the political imagination of unity and cohesion that are now taken for granted as India's continuum. Uh, before this, you could not conceive of what seems norm. Before the Mughals, you could not conceive what seems normative now, and India. Uh, there was the idea of the, in the ancient uh, term there was Bharat, which played out more in literary and mythological imagination than political practice. So the Mughals reinvented India, and the English inherited it. I em emphasize this because modernity as we know it did not simply arrive in India with the English and the Portuguese and the other Europeans in the 18th century. It was in that experimental way and not calling it modernity was practiced in India. So in reinventing India, the Mughals were able to integrate this sort of very disconnected regions of India then into one single whole. It was a collection of regional and political uh, diversities with some regions having no contact or knowledge of other regions. You know, if you imagine that American measure, you know, uh, sort of so spread out land and area and definitely no political cohesion. The one last cohesion was in the second century BC with, you know, the Mauryan Empire, but beyond that, nothing. The political unification during the Mughal time was possible through centralized imperial tools or practice calendric system, taxation, land division, administrative structure, and of course setting up cultural norms in cuisine, music, art, and architecture. And all this circulated without describing it as such as a pan-Indian ethos, the basis of modern India. And, and again, something I'd like to argue is deliberately overlooked and misinterpreted with the nature of, nature of politics in India and elsewhere. Even if this uh, unification was done for political expediency or aesthetical adventure, it created the necessity for the Mughals of addressing India's dynamic plurality. Not that wrongs were not committed and some policies were faith driven, but nonetheless it brought together different voices and claims into a theater of dialogue. Mughal art and architecture, its artistic and aesthetic production is, uh, this is again something that I would like to put a big question mark around, is regularly dubbed Islamic. And that is easy. As if Islam is an a-territorial ethos that just got dropped in India. There was no unitary sense of India prior to the 17th century and there was no singular vision of a political Islam until the 19th century. So to kind of, again, back project and say this is Islamic, we, you know, we just need to be a bit more careful. Because the dynamic and energetic production of the Mughals could flourish only in India out of an osmotic relationship with pre-existing traditions and practices in India. And that is critical to appreciate Mughal architecture and art. The pre-existing cultures may immediately associate it with Hinduism, but it is also about Jainism, Buddhism, and Mughal Emperor Akbar also entertained the, uh, the Charvaka materialist. You know, so in Indian traditions, you have atheist and materialist. You know, it's not predominantly one single religious practice. So the Mughals entered into a profitable interaction in that milieu. Mughal art and architecture relied on and therefore profited from what I call the synthesistic or syncretistic program. Syncretis syncreticism may sound cute and natural, but it has to be a practice. It just doesn't happen naturally. Something sometimes things do happen naturally when two different flows come together and become one or two simultaneously. The Mughals practiced that. So this, what I'm saying is that the, such uh, syncreticism could not have happened without royal or top level patronage. And I also like to qualify, it's not just a syncreticism, it's an exchange. I use the word osmosis. Syncreticism means like you bring different things together and make something a third. Osmosis that then, you know, each party gets affected. So it's an osmosis. 
It's a reciprocal artistic practice, learning from one another, rather than banning or shunning as one is up to do on a vanquished people. Just a few examples. Um, as you know, and I'm not going in a, in a sequence, uh, I, as I said, it's like a storytelling and things pop up whenever the ideas pop up. These are miniature paintings, which was also one genre which was uh, really uh, patronized by the Mughals. And what you see here are images or scenes from Hindu epics, which the Mughal kings, uh, Akbar especially, commissioned um, Hindu artists, Persian translators, and uh, you can see scenes from the Ramayana, and, uh, and on the right, you know, at Akbar's time, he was very much interested in Christianity. And this is a scene of Christ uh, by, I, I believe, a Hindu artist in a book which was a Persian book. So all that sort of things were going on. Translation, and I, I have a little story to tell. So Akbar, uh, you know, Akbar had this uh, group of advisors. They are called the Nine Jewels, uh, and one of them was Badauni, uh, and Abul Fazl was his most favorite. And he seemed, you know, when I talk about liberal practice and all that, Abul Fazl may have uh, advanced that more than anybody else. There were like sort of ideological differences between the different advisors. Abul Fazl wrote the Chronicles of Akbar, Akbar Nama, and the, you know, and uh, Aini Akbari. Uh, and, but there was Badauni, who was, in today's term, we might call fundamentalist. Akbar was clever or conservative. You know, he asked him to translate the Mahabharata into Persian. And then Akbar, well, he was illiterate. You know, here is the contradiction. So he discovered that, uh, uh, that there is a reference made in that book to heaven and hell. Akbar was perplexed. He had it checked by Brahmin scholars who said no. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a notion of heaven and hell in Hinduism, but that's not in the way like Judeo-Christian idea of heaven and hell. So Akbar had a second edition published. So he had this sort of check and balance kind of a thing. It's an editorial practice. So just, an, just as an example. And then Hindu artist, uh, painting, and then other more scenes from uh, the Mahabharata, which was translated, I'm sorry, as the Razam Nama. Um, and then Hindu artists, as I was saying, painting Persian miniatures, Hindu craftsmen working on mosques, and Persian craftsmen giving advice on other non-Islamic buildings. So there's a shared craftsmanship and appropriating what we might call Hindu aesthetics and motifs in Mughal buildings. Uh, it goes on and on. And there's the Ragmala paintings. I don't think I have that, not in this set. And uh, maybe this is, these are good miniatures, 1598 from Akbar's time. Um, Hindu and Muslim scholars translate the Mahabharata. They're not at each other's throat, but they're actually having a nice argument, you know, in terms of translation. And then I said music, uh, 12 musicians playing Indian and Persian instruments. You know, the whole genre of Indian classical music got an advancement through the Mughals, you know, and what we know as Indian classical music we have to owe to Akbar again. And then there's the Ragmala painting, uh, which I have an image maybe that will pop up, of uh, art, music, and narrative in one, um, one folio. So all those things were practiced. And I also have to say, let's not like give all credits to Akbar. Uh, Dara Shiko, who was the son of Shah Jahan, uh, a later Mughal king, who could not become the king because he was uh, executed by his brother who became the king, all that thing going on. But if anybody maintained the uh, mantle of Akbar, it was Dara Shiko. And this is incredible. He had uh, many Sanskrit texts translated into Persian. He developed a friendship with the seventh Sikh guru, Guru Harai. He devoted all his attention as a prince to finding a common mystical language between Islam and Hinduism. He had 50 Upanishads translated from Sanskrit to Persian. And he wrote the introduction. And in the introduction he says that in the Quran, and I don't know about that, but in the Quran there is a reference to a hidden book. So Quran is not the book, there's a reference of a hidden book. 
And Darashiko argues the hidden book is none other than the Upanishads. So that put him into trouble also with the conservatives at the office time, and there were like political rearrangement, and that led to his uh, death. But is another. But he wrote one book, which is known as the Majma Ul Bahrain. It translates, and that that translated title could be a title of my talk: the confluence of the two seas. And it, it was devoted to a mystical and pluralistic affinity between Sufi and Vedantic knowledge. I think it's imp incredibly important, and Deborah and I were having this talk a little earlier. Uh, you know, most of us don't seem to know about these things. And because of our uh, categorical political perspectives, we don't want to even listen to these things. I think some, some of these things needs to be foregrounded especially in today's uh, context where dialogue is threatened or almost non-existent. So uh, there are, uh, still there are dilemmas and, uh, but you know, let me go back to architecture. Uh, what do you see here? Uh, a very familiar uh, architectural piece. I won't even name it perhaps, uh, which led to the origin of the house. What I want to say that I don't describe it either as a Muslim architecture or it's other as Hindu architecture. I prefer the term more, I think it qualifies to me better as Timurid or Indic. Timurid is the kind of architecture that influenced by Persian architecture grew around in Central Asia. Um, an architecture of arches, domes, solid volumes, uh, tile work, geometric motifs, and especially that kind of quality which was picked up in the bedroom suite of inlays and the sort of what I call the lustrous quality of marble. So that's Timur Reed architecture. You don't find that all over. You don't find that in Ottoman architecture. You may be traces of this. You don't find that in Moroccan architecture. So there are distinctive cultural uh, qualities of, of this uni unified thing, Mughal architecture. So that's Timur Reed. And, and the Mughal dynasty are Timurid in their ethnic origin. So Babur brought that with him and the others, the artists and all. So an architecture of domes and arches, cubic volumes, marble or tile work, uh, and which then gets translated into Mughal architecture itself. You know, this Humayun's tomb in Delhi. That's the layout, you know, in that garden setting. Of, uh, and you will notice that uh, the Mughals lavished the biggest attention, the most monumental buildings are the mausoleums uh, of their dead kings. Uh, the palaces are very nondescript, you know, the palaces that they lived in, uh, because the mausoleums are actually palaces, uh, and with the garden is, is, a, is a representation of paradise, you know, this is a palace in paradise, you know, and therefore that got, got to be lavish and the biggest attention was given to it. It's a metaphor of paradise. Uh, and then Timurid architecture, this is the nature of Timurid architecture, sort of very cubic solid volume within which a sculpted shape has been scooped out, which becomes the niche as an arch. The mukarnas and, uh, and the arch gives it away. The pattern, geometric to floral, and not in this case, you have Arabic or Persian calligraphy. So that's uh, one thing you have. Uh, and then there were great city builders. This is a scene drawn by a British artist of Delhi on the walls of Delhi Fort. So city, which, and they built cities furiously. Fatehpur Sikri was one of them. And what I can't go into is the urban structure itself, a walled city with the various gates. This is old Delhi originally known as Shah Jahan Abad, established by the Emperor Shah Jahan. But the structure is very uh, critical. You know, you have the royal palace compound, you know, fort or palace complex, whatever you want to call it, which is, uh, has a strategic location, access to it through a main gate. But another important item here is the mosque, the royal mosque or the uh, city mosque or what is known as the Friday mosque. Uh, it's the symbol of the city, not the palace. The mosque is the symbol of the city. 
And you find that in all the major uh, Mughal cities, Delhi and Lahore, you know, the, 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 it's like the cathedral in medieval Europe, you know, the, the town and the city is known by the mosque. And you can see uh, semblances mainly of uh, Timurid architecture. So there was a uh, uh, decision in what kind of building type, what kind of language will be employed. In the mosque, it was primarily kind of a Timurid language. Even then, I would say it has a little, uh, you know, inflected by some other things. The palace complexes, they take on a particular quality. I mentioned before, they were not really quite monumental. Here's the, uh, the wall, the gate to the Red Fort in Agra. You go in and down through a set of shops, like a promenade, uh, and then the main palace, which is actually sort of this integration of quadrangles, typically very clear in their geometry and very axial, symmetrical, but also very simple, if you, if you may like. This is the Delhi fort, which so shows it very clearly. Uh, the red are the covered buildings, the corridors, the gardens, you know, and then that four square division of the garden. And along the wall are these various pavilions, you know, part of the residence. And this is what it looks like on the wall. It's an architecture of canopies, pavilions, terraces, and screens. So very low profile. From the city side, you would just see this sort of silhouette of, you know, canopies and screens. So I, I want you to notice things like this and that, and I, I would like to come back to it later. So already in the palace complexes, you are referring to a language which is not Timurid, uh, which is coming out of an interpretation or modulation of, say, uh, existing Indian architecture. There are many theories about the nature of the layout of such a, a royal complex, very low profile, very sort of axial, geometric, uh, one big theory, and perhaps there is a lot of uh, evidence for that, is that the palace complex was laid out as a tent, series of tents. You know, these were like originally nomads, it's in their blood, and they were always out on the hunt or warfare. And so setting up tent is a big thing to them, either coming from in the ethnic background or their imperial practice. And there are stories about when Akbar would go out and pitch tent during his warfare, you know, it's like a mobile uh, capital city. Uh, I, I get fascinated by the, when the cruise, cruise ships come in, you know, it's like a huge city, you know, and then it goes away. It's just like that, you know, Akbar's tent. And so the, the, the palace complex has often been referred as tents in stone. So therefore, low profile, you know, very, it's like this, very airy. Uh, what you don't see today uh, are, you know, so this is an image from somewhere else, you know, actually a pitched camp. A uh, lot of uh, canvas, fabric, awnings, carpets, the sort of, uh, the temporary things. And they've just vanished. So if you go to a palace complex now, you'll just see the stone buildings, but then, when they were activated, uh, they were activated by all these temporary things, and they look quite, you know, similar to this. Um, so this is, uh, sh you know, in the Delhi Fort. Uh, that's actually the uh, the main audience hall of the king. You know, that's a plain, simple pavilion, uh, but it would be activated by such things. And of course, you know, the regalia and you know the throne seat and all that. You know. Uh, so, Mughal architecture is described by such things, palaces and gardens, you know, uh, you know so the, uh, it's a kind of intersection and combination of an independent building or a building that's attached to a long uh, arcade, opening into a garden or a courtyard, you know, so it's a whole set of uh, constructed landscape, I would call it. Interestingly, this is from Vienna, from a wall paneling. Uh, where they, you know, they uh, attached miniature painting into a wall panel. Uh, and then, of course, Mughals built gardens, uh, you know, and t the, uh, Babur, the first emperor, when he was not warring, he would be building gardens. So it's an interesting switch from one thing to the other, you know, uh, and he invested a lot in the infrastructure of gardens. So what we today know as, known, known, uh, know as Mughal garden, an example of that is right here, a representation or a copy. Uh, we owe it to Akbar, uh, I'm sorry, Babur, the first king. 
and you can see right here and you know and the garden comes with all kind of accessories and you can recognize some of this uh, right over here and then the interiors which you can recognize also uh, kind of again persian ottoman you know not quite from moroccan Mor morocco would be very far away uh, but then of course something like this that would be a fav favorite uh, item in mogul architecture screens Marble screens, you know, that's from Fatipur Sikri, and what I found amazing, and here, and I always talk about that, uh, the Mughal suite has these marble screens that slide. Uh, it's just incredible. You know, first of all, to cut those perfectly by hand is one thing, which were done in the 1930s in India. Well, they were doing it in the 16th century, so that's a trade that stays on, I believe. I don't know now. But then to have that whole heavy marble slab move, and very beautifully, I thought that was amazing. Um, okay. Uh, Barber supervising the making of a garden, that's him. So I would say if he had been doing more gardening, I don't know what would have happened to the Mughal Empire. Uh, at the same time, I can just show you a couple of Im images that what the Mughals saw or earlier uh, Central Asian people who came in uh, to India, what could be described as Indian architecture or Hindu architecture, whatever name you want to give it. It's a different kind of a language. Uh, and I, I can just show you two examples, uh, the very well-known Kandarya Mahadeva Temple and the Sun Temple in Konarak. The language is more post and lintel, not arches, what technically architects call trabiation, or trabiated versus arches or arcuated. <laughs> but anyway, post and lintel versus arches in a different language, and a language, language of canopies, which you can just see, read here, you know, overhangs. And you can see here, in fact, it's, uh, I call it stratification. So this is actually a useful canopy, and the rest is actually a visual stratification of the canopy. So uh, Orison architecture reads more as stratas. Rather, if you compare this with Timurid architecture, which is a very solid blank wall from which uh, arch has been scooped out. In this case, it's more like a pavilion. Uh, so chhatris, as they're called, canop canopies, overhanging eaves, and what you cannot see in this detail are very elaborate bracket system, because if you throw in a canopy, you need a bracket to support that. Sometimes it's uh, structurally required, sometimes it's just an aesthetical thing, and they're heavily sculpted. Uh, sandstone as a material. So all in all, it's a kind of a pavilion-like quality and not so boxed in as Persian or Timurid architecture. So here we have an architectural challenge, a conflict between the pavilion and the box. And if I can again bring you back to the bathroom, uh, bedroom bathroom suite here, uh, the screens go back and forth. It changes the quality of the room totally from a box to a pavilion. As here, if you pull the screens, back, uh, it's a total different environment. So again, this is a conflict between domes and versus eaves, between pavilion versus boxes. That kind of uh, was a challenge for Mughal architects and Ottoman architects also. I would say Ottoman architecture is a very interesting example. Another way to look at it, what the Mughals did here is Fatipur Sikriya building, which it is a syncretistic building. You have a dome, you have a fake arch, uh, you have brackets, you have canopies, uh, and red sandstone, not marble. This was in the royal palace, and you know, I could have easily applied marble. So uh, Akbar going tropical, that's how I say it. So somebody should write a little essay or something, tropical mogul, that has not been done. And I have two colleagues here who are masters in tropical architecture, but this is actually going tropical. Right? Why would you need a canopy? Uh, okay, and another thing, so uh, we're talking about imperial practice, and you know how imperialism works. We should know it very well, actually. I shouldn't want to say too much about it, but imperialism is a kind of a centralized power, and it reaches out to different uh, zones and horizons with, the, with which you have no direct relationship, only that they belong to you. Right, and you want to extract whatever you want to extract. You know, very simply, that's how imperialism occurs. But there's a paradox. 
So that distant region belongs to you. You're in the center. There is a conflict between center and periphery, between center and the region. And there's a tension between centralized and regional. And for that, I, I'm showing you this. This is a uh, throne seat pavilion within that building that you have seen earlier with the red awning. So this is where the emperor sat. Shah Jahan sat under this structure. I know uh, in uh, Italian and English, it would be the baldacchino, baldacchin. That's a throne seat. And a lot of people have worked on it. It's called a jharoka in Hindi or Urdu. Uh, it's one architectural piece. And uh, historians and authors like Robert Skelton and Eba Koch cite the throne jharoka as a perfect example of an assimilation, an image of the Mughal state. Before this, you know, uh, Mughal emperors would sit under a tent, a uh, tent canopy, which is, you know, if you look at miniatures, all Timurid, Persian, and uh, Mughal kings are typically shown in a garden under a very well-crafted tent, sometimes even double-layered. You know, I, I didn't bring up any image today. But that's now been translated into this beautiful marble canopy. But why uh, historians like Eba Koch is saying that this is an uh, uh, example of assimilation? Because it becomes a marble structure, not a tent. It becomes a baldachin. And then this particular shape that you see is a representation, a literal representation, of the curvilinear thatch roof from Bengal. I don't, I, I don't have an image of that, but you know, it's like a bamboo roof, you know, pulled back to throw off the rain and all that. It's a thatch roof. It's a beautiful shape. And the shape is called Bangla, you know, and it's in the region called Bangladesh. I'm not claiming anything right here, nationalistically speaking, but it's called Bangla. And that's where the bang, word bungalow comes from, because the English loved it also. And the English developed this sort of isolated house. This would be a bungalow quality. Forget all the details and all that, you know, airy cross ventilation, that's a bungalow. Uh, and that comes from Bangla. And the Mughals appropriated that shape, just a rural thatch hut. They brought it to the imperial capital. They built the, you know, the throne seat in marble of that shape. And they banned that anybody else can do that, only the emperor. So it became a sign of imperial appropriation of the provinces through architecture. Yes, I, nobody else can do that. And that became a motif. Uh, if you go to uh, the Red Fort in Agra, Delhi, or Lahore, you will see this sorry, shape popping up. And that means it's a pavilion for the emperor, not for anybody else. Whether he is sitting there and he, he does the darshan, you know, viewing of the emperor. It was actually, I, re, I was reading about it recently. It's, it was tough to be an emperor. I tell you, you have to get up early in the morning like that, and stand in the charoka so your people can see you every morning. Because if you're not there one morning, unless you are somewhere else warfaring, uh, they'll think that something must have happened. You have been chopped off. So he has to show that I'm around, you know? Uh, no TV at that time. Uh, even when King George, uh, the last <laughs> imperial ruler, British, came, he and his consort would stand under the baldacchino. You know, that was a kind of shift of the sign from one emperor to another. So that, yeah, that's one image of the emperor sitting under the pavilion. So the Bangla roof was appropriated by Bengal, from Bengal, by Akbar's charismatic Rajput general, Man Singh, who was from the Rajput area, Rajasthan area, but he was fighting for Akbar. He is the one who helped conquer Bengal. And he, he took that form took it to the capital and made it something imperial, an imperial sign. Uh, some people call it monumentalization of the vernacular. And something like this was not seen before, this kind of adaptation. As I said, and no one else was allowed to use this. So the Bangla Baldakin was an imperial invention, uh, invention of an imperial dynamic. And it's interesting that, uh, oh, here you are, the Bangladar. It's called the uh, Naulaka, and in the Bangladar is a Mughal term. You know, that shape is called Bangladar. And this is in Lahore Fort, and it's in marble. 
uh, and uh, maybe it has a resonance with this building other than the shape, but then you need that shape because it means that the emperor resides there. Uh, there are imperial mosques, which is quite interesting because typically in mosques you refer to Timurid architecture, but in the imperial mosques, uh, within the royal palace, instead of a dome, you have a Bangladar. So I find that an interesting uh, shift. Uh, when, so what I find interesting, and this is another whole story, and I, I had started writing about this, the travel of the Bangla roof a while ago. I should return to it after being invited to give this talk. I'm kind of energized to do this. Because you, you go to Rajasthan, you'll find all these sort of uh, Rajput palaces, and which have all, the, now they've become decorative, you know. So these are like Mughal examples. Uh, that's one of the mosques in, I, I, I think in Delhi, you know. So the entrance, the pavilion, the pavilion, that's kind of originally was gold-plated. And that's Rajasthan, Rajput. So, you know, what, Muslim, Hindu? No, it's like another uh, topic, totally. Okay, back to Akbar. I have to say a few things about him. Uh, and I'll end with that. Because this is the man who kind of initiated all this. So if syncretism is one of the gifts of the Mughals, whether as a political astute way of doing things or the natural way of doing things in Babel Sam India, uh, there were conservatives and contrarians and obstructionists on all sides. So we have to go back to the illiterate genius Akbar because he is at the center of all this. The empire, the world, you know, this is a kind of a, a uh, conjectured, cooked up uh, image, Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan, three generations, you know, uh, Akbar in the middle. It's the triumvirate. Uh, as long as Akbar lived, his court and religious elite, um, although they resisted him, like Badawani, he's one of his advisors, went along with him, whether due to psychophancy or unable to express their views, whatever it is, he's the emperor, you know, off with your head. Uh, but they went along with his uh, uh, innovations. Well, what Akbar really attempted was a new social order based on rationalist thinking, deep inquiry, and a kind of humanism that was not seen before, that faltered with his death. This idea of pursuit of knowledge and truth for the sake of it, and in a very productive way, and Akbar also became a little deca decadent later, but he, what he initiated, one could say died off with him, but its traces stayed on. And that's what, you know, we call it secular culture and what have you in another way, but that was a practice that he initiated. So there are two things one must admire about Akbar's personality, his inquisitive mind and his religious tolerance, and one followed the other. And of course, Akbar had the strong Sufi inheritance, you know, this mystical, individualistic, devotional, and syncretistic practice, if you are aware of the Sufi strand in Islamic traditions. Because Akbar realized too quickly that in such a place as India, uh, unitarian theocracy, which the ulemas or the mullahs wanted, will not work. And he was a pragmatic man. That was a strategy to root state and statecraft Imperial policies have to embrace many divergent issues, and some of the things that I've shown you from painting to architecture is a, an example of that. And he quite convincingly argued that the guiding principles of his state should be, uh, to be uh, in order for that to be endearing and acceptable, must be seen as equitable to all its citizens. Instead of being imprisoned by dogmas, by mullahs and other people. So he encouraged learning history, philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, medicine. And Akbar himself practiced that. I, I didn't know until a few days ago that uh, not only he was interested in promoting, uh, you know, in his royal palace, he had workshops. You know, I don't know what which royal palace has workshops. Art workshop, print workshop, you know, and uh, music workshop. Meaning people played music, you know, as I mentioned, he kind of established classical music genre in a big way. Akbar himself played an instrument, uh, kind of a wind instrument, I can't name it now. So uh, he was a crazy man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, his Abul Fazl quoted his advisor that, you know, I'm not reading it out, you know, truth doesn't lie in dogmatic obedience. You know, it must be a pursuit of truth with all sincerity. 
And I have another, uh, it, it's, for those of you who are familiar with Mughal architecture, you will know that. Akbar wrote a letter to the king of Spain at that time. And the king of Spain was very nicely, you know, executing the non-Catholics, you know. Uh, and Akbar was worried about the Muslims and the Jews there. And he wrote to the king to leave them kindly alone. It was a nice letter. And in the letter he mentioned this. Um, the uh, pursuit of truth as the noblest aim of the human intellect. Therefore we associate with learned men of all religions. And arguing for discourse. And in the same letter, he <laughs> asks him whether he could send him some few books on Christianity. So it's an interesting letter, you know, from one emperor to another. Just first, you know, stop killing, and then, you know, let's be reasonable, let's have a discourse, and can you send me some books? Uh, and this is not just one thing, you know, he, uh, he, you know, not only encouraging uh, Hindus and Jains, uh, he also encouraged the first sort of Christian uh, presence in India was because of Akbar. So he's saying that I'm sending my ambassador to a Portuguese Jesuits group to send me two learned priests who should bring with them the principal books of the law and the gospel so that I may learn the law and what is most perfect in it. And uh, that is incredible. So in Fatipur Sikri, he had, you know, uh, had a pavilion, and it was called the Ibadat Khana, which gets translated as the temple, and that's totally a wrong translation. It's not a temple. It's a space like this, where he would entertain Jesuit priests, Muslim scholars, Hindu writers, um, and it's a place for a discussion. Uh, and also at, you know, so Akbar was getting a little ahead of his time. So he made an imperial declaration that he himself has the authority to interpret religious law. If you say that today, you know what's going to happen, you know, in Islam, you know, the, the, the mullahs. So superseding the authority of the mullahs. And when he was able to do that, then only he was able to craft this interreligious and multicultural state to the point that then he invented a new religion, which is called the Dini Ilahi, which combined elements from Islam, Hinduism, and Joroastrianism. It died with Akbar, but he tried. So I would call these practices or innovations as Akbari. You know. uh, even if it vanished, it traces remains. So what I'll do quickly is show you some uh, architectural, you know, uh, what I, what I will show you here is the painting, the manuscript workshop, um, painting. This is a Timurid miniature painting. And then what I mentioned before, the Ragmala, which is picked up by a uh, Hindu artist. And uh, yeah, now I know Akbar may not have been able to read. He read comics. <laughs> yeah, graphic novels, you know, and that's a theory that he didn't need to read. He just saw, you know, this illustration and therefore he encouraged illustrations. So I have a few images of uh, Fatehpur Sikri, and I'll end with that. I won't say too much about it, because that's another story. The city he built as an experimentation, which kind of not quite Timurid, Persian, uh, mainstream Mughal architecture, but as a grand experimentation. Um, the, and I, again, I, I don't think I have time to go into the history of it. The reason to build a capital city away from Delhi and Agra, the main capitals, in a place where there was nothing, just a shrine of a Sufi saint which Akbar venerated and who'd, who actually prophesied that Akbar will have a male son and when the male son was born, that's one story, that Akbar went and built the capital around the shrine. So if you go to uh, Fatipur Sikri now in the courtyard of the mosque, you will see the shrine of Sheikh Shalim Chisti, which is in marble but with all the canopy and the Indianized brackets with the dome and this is Akbar's throne capital. Uh, this looks like a, this is a drawing, but it's actually built, so it's not a conjecture. Uh, the building of Fatipur Sikri, the layout of Fatipur Sikri, which I won't go into, and uh, here I was trying to compare, you know, and that looks, sounds too academic, uh, you know, the 
plan type uh, arrangement of the Timurid style red fort and then Fatipur Sikri. It's very axial, all I can say, symmetrical, while in Akbar's palace complex in Fatipur Sikri, axes are shifted, they're independent buildings, you know, it's much more, it's modern, you know, uh, again, we have some architects here, it's, it's Bauhaus. Yes, will you agree? <laughs> uh, so the, the, in the mosque, of course, there is a very sort of Timurid style architecture, but if you see the royal palace, you see things like this. Uh, that little thing is Akbar's main audience hall. This is Akbar's chamber, he lived here. I know, it's just like an uh, elongated shack. Uh, but it had all those awnings and stuff like that, and musicians played here, and he sat there. Uh, we don't know exactly where that Ibadat Khana, the discourse pavilion was, but it may have been a temporary structure. The Panch Mahal, again, they all had screens and beautiful uh, canvases, you know, the, uh, the audience hall. Uh, again, the whole architecture of brackets and stuff like that. And this is, uh, that's in the center, you know. So in all royal palaces, you had two uh, audience halls, one for the general public and one for your ministers and close associates. So this is one for the close associates. Nobody has able to, uh, to describe why Akbar built this. In the middle of the chamber, you have a pillar with this sort of bracket-like thing. And from the top, four uh, catwalks going to four diagonal corners. Yeah. Uh, that may look like, you know, Axis Mundi, you know, or the four quarters, the ruler of the four quarters. Uh, but why have this sort of stage there? You know, it's an odd position to be sitting there and administering and talking to people. So we don't know yet. Uh, another more uh, convenient description is that that's where Akbar sat and counted his diamonds and stone. He looked secure and you could see who's coming or not. Uh, so that's the language of Fatipur Sikri. Um, so as I said, with my apprehension of Mughal architecture, when I first went to Fatipur Sikri, I don't know, 1979 or so, I was, you know, people have talked about Fatipur Sikri analyzed to death. I was just, you know, amazed, you know, I, you know and this is my kind of architecture. Uh, this is supposed to be the palace of Jodhbai, a Rajput queen, Akbar married. And you can see the very sort of, you know, Indianized uh, detailing, if you like, with the Timurid arch. This is, uh, and so uh, the palace may have looked like this in details. It's actually, uh, you know, a Hindu epic depicted in a kind of Timurid architectural royal palace. But you can, you can see the details here. Okay, I, I was going to say a few things that perhaps a degree of... Uh, Continuation, whether directly or otherwise, continued in some other projects. Uh, Corbusier, when he was designing the assembly building in Chandigarh, went to Fatipur Sikri, looked at it closely, and people have analyzed the, you know, the roof elements in Corbusier's building is about the juxtaposition of different elements instead of fusing it into one. So I'm not saying Corbusier, uh, there are sketches of Corbusier of Fatipur Sikri, so he, it was not unknown to him. And Indian architects like Charles Correa, you know, uh, has his state assembly, which is actually a collection, an assemblage of elements from Buddhist stupa to all kind of shapes and forms. Um, and especially uh, Charles Correa, who is a very well-known Indian architect, his Crafts Museum in Delhi, uh, the layout has a similar resonance of Fatipur Sikri, a series of movement through courtyards and shifting axes. And then independent buildings versus attached buildings, small courtyards, big courtyards. So that's uh, what I had for you. And I, maybe just one final comment. Uh, it's a little provocation, ending with a little provocation, as if I have not given you enough provocations. As I said, I could talk about Fatipur Sikri a bit more. Why is it a city? Why build it there? You know, and then why he shifted? You know, and what kind of experiments were going on there? But a provocation is this. Uh, Doris Duke had quite a few houses and estates in the Duke Imperium. Yet she built Shangri-La in a kind of loving way and enjoyed being here away from the madness of the metropolis. So one theory about Fatipur Sikri is also that Akbar wanted to get away from the intrigues and all that that goes on in the established capitals, Delhi and Agra, and, and, and have the nobles move around all the time. And, and in, with that 
crossing, you see he had much better control. I don't know. So uh, I was thinking about that. And uh, she built her little palace complex here as a kind of encampment also, as an un ensemble of things with shifting axes. I do notice one or two with interlocked volumes, courtyards, and often independent buildings, you know. I'm just pushing this a little bit, you know, as a provocation. So was Doris Duke an alter ego of Akbar? Uh, yeah. Imperious, but experimental. <laughs> so uh, conducted in an Akbari style is Shangri-La, an incarnation of Fatipur Sikri. Thank you.